all right so all of that was regard to the was uh, regarding the physical topology and the connectivity of the graph now let's look at how it gets implemented right there are a few issues with regard to the actual implementation that we need to think about the first one is with regard to routing algorithms so you will see over here that i'm talking about routing and switching as two separate things right and that's intentional routing in general means what path should data take in order to get from a to b right whereas switching is a much more local strategy question it's just at a given node if i see a piece of data coming in what should i do with it should i send it north south east west right so typically switching strategies are sort of more local routing strategies build on top of them okay so routing strategies are in one uh, sort of a slightly higher level of abstraction than switching and finally there is also the concept of flow control which we'll get to at the end so right now let's look at routing the idea in routing is how do i select a path from a source to a destination in a given topology okay so let's start by what would we consider a good routing algorithm what are desirable characteristics of a good routing algorithm even right even if there are uh, non uniform traffic patterns that is data needs to be i mean you know uh, there is some sudden burst of data that is coming from one source going to one particular destination or something else is happening that suddenly requires more bandwidth to be given to one particular uh, node or element i should be able to handle that right i should be able to balance the load and spread it out among all the links ideally minimize the latency it's fine if you you know on the one hand it's good to say yeah i will always make sure that data gets from a to b but if that data getting from a to b is after a too long a duration it may simply not be acceptable right the other thing which is highly desirable is can you tolerate faults okay now fault tolerance in normal digital design in a shared bus design for example we very rarely think about faults occurring in the system right that's usually an afterthought right while designing the system itself we assume that wires gates modules that are built up using those are all flawless okay meaning that they work exactly as they were intended to always the problem is that's not always how systems work things can go wrong even a wire can overheat melt get disconnected right and gates of course can have other kinds of problems associated with them once again related to you know it might be that one particular connection over there uh, degraded with age or with heating right there are other kinds lots of effects that can either show up as faults as soon as the system is built or come up later okay in actual digital circuits what's usually done is very often in most of the things that we use right if a chip fails you replace the chip right you pretty much have to take it for repair and get it replaced in more and more complex systems you can't really afford to do that so you will find that there will be some kind of testing that is done in order to identify faults and maybe just work around them statically work around them right so you might for example know about how when you look at intel processors you have processors that work at different speeds and no they cost different amounts of money bottom line right why is that it's not as though they are actually building things intentionally to cost different amounts of money what they do is they just build a large number of chips then figure out okay some of these have problems in this cache memory disable that cache memory and sell it at a lower cost okay so it's essentially yield related what happens is there are problems that come in they are statically fixed meaning that at one time i run a test check whether there is a problem just disable that part of the chip and sell it what we are talking about here is can you tolerate faults at run time are there ways by which you can actually figure out that something has gone wrong and work around it okay now taxonomy basically classification right there are a few different ways of looking at routing algorithms one of them the word that is used is oblivious basically meaning that it does not care about the state of the network oblivious means it does not look into detail in of the at the internal state of what is happening the routing algorithm is just based on something else that does not look at what is happening at each individual node in much detail okay even within oblivious 
algorithms you have two variants one of them is so called deterministic and the other is randomized right and then there are adaptive algorithms that will actually change how they behave they can even adapt based on the state of the network traffic okay so an example of an oblivious algorithm is something called 2d xy routing this is something called dimension ordered routing essentially what it says is the x dimension is given a higher order or uh, higher priority than the y dimension so let's say that i want to transmit from this node 20 in the bottom right to node 11 which is somewhere in the middle of the network i'll first go along x which means i need to go minus 1 in the x direction and then plus 1 in the y direction okay and i will end up getting to my destination okay a torus allows you to do a bit more than that it says that i now have two possible routes i can go this way or i can go this way right so from 10 i can also directly jump to 13 if necessary in other words right because there is a direct connection between the two okay now one possible problem that you could encounter in such a situation is every node is essentially going to do x first routing then y okay what if two nodes over here simultaneously try to transfer data to one tree okay how do you handle such a situation because after all each node is only looking at its immediate state and trying to send data okay both of them are trying to send data to one tree what should happen you this is a situation called deadlock right at its very basic this is a already you have hit deadlock right it's as though two people are basically trying to get through the door both of them come at exactly the same time you don't know what to do right if both of them just say okay no i need to get through the door and i'm not going to give away you are stuck that's deadlock how do you resolve it one of them has to give away one of them steps back says okay you first right that can go the problem is what if both step back and both are equally polite right so both packets over here in this case both sources back off and say okay i'll try again after one clock cycle after one clock cycle nothing has changed right so they can keep on trying to hit each other over here and end up in deadlock right there are of course these are problems that have been studied for like more than 40 years or so in the area of networking theory itself which is why of course the network on chip idea became popular right because the entire theory of how to study networks and what kind of network protocols to use was already there if you can bring it down to a chip level there are so much theory that you can build upon so how do you handle that there are many ways you know you do different randomized back off exponential back off each one or you just send the data somewhere else etc right there are ways of resolving deadlock in other words in this case yeah and so what i mentioned over here is a deterministic variant which basically says that i will always try to go along x then go along y right you could look at randomized variants where they try to go in different orders based on some random condition at each node okay the other possibility is to overall sort of spread the traffic around what if i want to sort of you know the case that i showed with the mesh where everybody is trying to talk to six and everyone finally ends up getting to six through different ports would just this xy routing be able to achieve that possibly not so what i could do instead is maybe say that for everybody that wants to talk to some destination a right you first send your packets to some random location and then from there try sending it to a and pick that random location at random right so how does that help it has actually been shown that that helps to spread the traffic around the network a lot more cleanly and can prevent bottlenecks from forming or at least can avoid the formation of bottlenecks in many cases right obviously it has drawbacks of its own we are not going to get into those right now adaptive routing on the other hand is trying to introduce some intelligence into the problem of routing right you need to have some sense of the network state so it's no longer oblivious it's not sort of saying i don't care what is happening at the next node 
I need to know something about what is happening around me in the rest of the network, right. The problem is it is very difficult to get a global picture for what is happening around the network. What you can get is local information. So, for example, when I am sitting over here at 0, 0, I can easily sense the amount of traffic on my immediate neighbors, right. That is this link and this link I know how much traffic is there, right. And based on that, I can then decide which link is better to send data out onto, right. So, in this particular case, I want to go from 1, 0 to 1, 3. The normal routing order would simply say I do not have a delta x at all. So, just send it along 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3. The problem is this link is congested. Congested meaning there is already traffic going on between 1, 1 and 1, 2, okay. So, what do you do? You route around it. and you go here, okay. Why was that possible? Because 1, 1 had information about its neighbors. It knew that the 1, 2 link was crowded. So, it sent the data on to 2, 1 and from there I proceeded continued with the x, y routing protocol. 2, 1 was able to send it up to 2, 2 then go back to 1, 2 and then from there go to 1, 3, okay. The problem is Imagine a situation where for example, you have something like this, I'm not sure how e clearly it is visible over at this distance, but 0 1 to 0 2 is slightly congested, whereas 1 1 to 1 2 and 2 1 to 2 2 are heavily congested, right. But what happened? 0 1 looks at its local information, it sees that 0 1 to 0 2 is congested. 0, 1 to 1, 1 is not, it promptly sends the data in that direction, but that is only made it worse, right. If you have tried driving with Google Maps in heavy traffic conditions, you will see that this actually happens in practice, right. It sometimes tell you, okay, fine, you know, this road ahead of you is congested, take a turning over here and you end up far worse off than you were. So, again, same story, right, internet networks, networks on chip, traffic, all the same thing. But Bottom line is adaptive routing is not going to solve all your problems, it can create problems of its own. How does routing get implemented, right? How do you actually implement this in practice? There are many variants, uh, one of uh, broadly you can classify them as table based and algorithmic. Table based essentially means that I just need to look up something in order to know where to go next, okay. Within that there are a few variants. The source routed variant effectively says the source that is trying to send out the data will give the routing information all the way up to the destination, okay. So, that is interesting. It is sort of like saying that if I want to go from here to Ananagar, the map is straight away going to tell me right now, okay, you know, take this road, take the left over here, get onto this road, go there, go there, go there and tell me all the way up to my destination it is a static route which was determined at my source and I am just going to follow that. What is the good part about it? Following instructions is very easy, I do not need to think, I just get to each intersection, what does the instruction tell me? Go straight, turn left, turn right, follow that. So, the implementation becomes very easy, right. The problem is it cannot adapt at all because the source does not really get a global picture of what is happening, it does not even get picture of any congestion that is happening later, okay. On the other hand, supposing I say that at every traffic intersection, the policeman is basically going to tell you whether to go straight or left or right and you just blindly follow instructions, right. You can or rather one slightly better thing is you go there and ask the policeman I want to get to Ananagar, how should I go? He will probably tell you okay right now this road is crowded, you take the left next intersection again the person you ask over there and then they tell you where to go. That is each router needs to store information about its local, uh, you know, the congestion, but also needs to know that if I want to get to Ananagar, how do I go about doing it, right. So, how do I get to a certain destination? This is the kind of stuff that is done in the internet protocol for example, right. I mean there are routers that maintain global level routing tables right, which broadly tell you that if you want to send a packet of data to somewhere in the US, you need to essentially go through these kind of hops, 
but that is about it. The detailed routing is probably at a different level. The good thing is they can adapt because these routing tables can be updated. The problem is it is also harder to scale because when there are more nodes in the network, the routing tables become larger. Okay. Algorithmic routers are ones where you say I will actually do a computation to figure out which way to route. I will have some kind of logic that gets implemented which basically takes certain inputs. The inputs could be the state of congestion, maybe a few other things and actually have some logic that will finally give me a value. That value will say which port, which output port of the router to send the data on. 